thanks everyone. Um, hello and welcome to our Protected Reflections event, um, supporting student wellbeing services um, and key student insights. Um, thank you for taking the time out and joining us today. Um, I know it's peak holiday season. Um, so we'll be running um, a live Q&A with our speakers at the end of the session. So we've enabled the Q&A feature in Zoom. So if you have any questions at all, please just pop them in there. Um, and we'll also hopefully be running some polls um, throughout the session. Um, and we'd love you to take part in those. Um, I'm Lisa Ravenscroft. I'm the Communications Manager at Protected. Um, and I'm very pleased to welcome today's speakers, Billy Fitzjohn, who's the Senior Partnership Development Manager at Emsley Insurance Services, and Jamie Boyle, who's the Partnership Development manager at Ensley Insurance. Um, so this morning we'll be discussing the structures and practice that Ensley have developed to support students and staff's mental health. We'll also look at the results from um, the happiness index report that Ensley um, has published in conjunction with the MUS to give us a glimpse into the current student feeling and a look at mental health support in action. Our speakers um, We'll first go through their presentation and then we have some questions and then we'll open up some questions to the floor. So um, Billy and Jamie, welcome. Thank you again for joining us. Um, do you want to start yeah. your presentation? And I'll mute sure. you. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Uh, hi, everyone. Lisa, I was just um, thinking we, we're not... We're usually used to Teams over Zoom. We've got into the ha habit of that, but I can't actually see um, anyone other than yourself and Jamie. Or is that normal for, for this webinar? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you oh. can't see. You can't see them. It just says attendees. You can go on the attendees um, list and it'll tell you who's okay. there. But it looks like someone might be having trouble. So I'll go and help them. Um, and you can... Crack on. Have you? Can you share your screen? Have you? Uh, just. If you go into. It's not letting me share screen at the moment. Sorry. If you're a co-presenter, you should be able to. Is there, is there a green thing at the bottom that says share screen? Yeah, I've got it now. Sorry. There we go. Brilliant. Yeah, that's all working. I'll. I'll turn myself off now. Can you see the full presentation or is it my my deck? Is it just the slide? We can see your full computer screen, so not the slide. Not the slide. OK, bear with me two seconds. OK, brilliant. You can see the slide there, yeah? Yes, yeah. Great. Is that the full? Um, I think you can see like the next slide in your notes. So I think if you go to. Oh, sorry yeah <laughs> fly settings and then maybe slideshow i think yeah bear with me sorry everyone there we are can you see yeah, just the perfect. slide now perfect <laughs> we got there okay so uh yeah hi everyone i was just saying at the start of this call uh, at the start of the pandemic we got used to using zoom uh, and then we have to get used to using Teams. And then it's been a while since Jamie and I have actually used uh, Zoom. So we're just getting our, getting our heads around, around that. So, uh, uh, yeah, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, as Lisa said, uh, my name is Billy. I'm joined by my colleague, Jamie. Um, together, we've been at Ensley Insurance Services for 11 years each, uh, having previously worked at a university and a students' union as well um, before I joined Ensley. So got an understanding for the, the the sector and how universities and and the organizations within and around them are sort of made up so i um, really pleased to be talking to you today about our student assistance program but uh, sharing some real student insights uh, in terms of uh, the service and what we provide and how students are using it but a little bit around the general insight that we get from the market as well uh, around sort of well-being and safety that, that will hopefully uh, be of interest to you so uh, just before uh, we, we, we um, get started, I did have a quick poll, just again, check if this works, Lisa. Um, are you able to, to put the first poll up? 
it's already set live so it's there if anyone people have been answering it so oh okay great cool. cool you should be able to see it as well okay i can't actually see it oh. right now so I've, got, I've got a little billy so um I, people who know that if we did um kind of this this well-being and student assistance program so we've got one yes and uh, and three no's okay that's thank you for, for 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 that so yeah we'll tell you a little bit more about what the program is and 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 and, and how we kind of you know got got into supporting partners in this way but i suppose just to sort of start off really a little bit more around um who we are at Ensley. so we were established nearly 60 years ago. Uh, we we're actually founded uh, by students, so the National Union of Students, uh, and that was to actually create an insurance organisation when it was extremely difficult for students to even be insured back then. So we actually founded almost 60 years ago, and we're very proud that today we're still endorsed and recommended by the National Union of Students and they still uh, have, have a seat on, on our board effectively. So that just means that everything that we do, our products, our services, the core part of our business really is students and education and making sure that all of our products and services are fit and, and designed for, for students. Um, we're very proud to be working with almost a thousand partners across the education sector. So universities, private student accommodation providers, student unions, language schools. Uh, we also work in the further education space as well with independent schools as well. So very proud to be supporting the education sector. And to kind of call out some, some, some headlines there really, we, we protect 98% of student unions in the UK. So that's when students are, you know, running their societies on campus or protecting their students' union liabilities over the nightclub events that happen there. Um, and we're also very proud to be working with over 80% of universities falls residence insurance, whereby student goes to university uh, as part of their accommodation package, they're automatically insured for their contents while they're there. And over half a million students benefit from that, from universities to private purpose-built halls providers as well. We're an award-winning provider, so really proud that four years in a row we've been voted for by students uh, for Best Student Insurer at the Recognised Insurance Choice Awards, uh, and hopefully we, we, we can continue with that. And then the final area, which we're going to talk a little bit more about today, is that we're very proud now to be providing a student assistance programme to over 60 universities and colleges across the country that provides wellbeing support to 400,000 students and we'll tell you a little bit more about that product and how it all works today and, and how students are engaging with that. So just going on to the next slide. So when when we uh, when when we look at uh, all of our products and services, we very much take an insight led approach to everything that we do. So if we're going to develop a new product or improve you know, a current product or service, we need to be making sure that we're taking an insight led approach. So what does that look like? So that means speaking with our partners, universities, accommodation providers, student unions, but it also means speaking with students. And we have an extensive network of, uh, of ability really to be able to engage with students on a regular basis. That's through focus groups, workshops, um, we also have a student panel, which we engage with on a monthly basis um, to be asking them pulse surveys and things like that about their, their, their thoughts on, on, on certain issues. But I wanted to talk a little bit uh, more about one of our flagship uh, uh, insight areas, which we started last year. Uh, and the, the results of this is from August 2021, where we, in partnership with the NUS, looked to understand students' happiness levels. So we uh, launched the Student Happiness Index, which we're very proud to be doing again this year, to understand a little bit more about what our students feeling when it comes to what they're concerned about, anxious about, what they, how optimistic do they feel, uh, what are they feeling basically, and what are their views of the here and now, but also the future throughout the, 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 the university. Um, we'll be happy to share the full report with you, but what we wanted to do today was just share some, some snippies with you. And I had the first poll. So, Jamie, if you could again just tell me uh, 
what were the results of this, which is last August 2021, what was the biggest concern for students? What have people been saying out of the options there, Jamie? Oh, great, I can see it now. So I, I think that's just launched. I've not done a poll before, but I, that's uh, that's just that's just launched now. So okay, I'm not getting some answers through already. I think I might have had the answer already on the slide uh, and I have to track back as I was getting used to the slides, but um, looks like uh, we've got hundred uh, percent answers of, of the right answer there. And you can, you can see here uh, that, um, you know, mental health was, was the primary concern for students around uh, COVID-19. Um, so, so standing out quite, quite a bit there. Uh, what we also uh, wanted to understand was what was actually causing students the most concern and, and anxiety. And again, this was back in August 2021, and you can see the top three areas there. So um, the Black Lives Matter movement and racial equality and climate change be, being out there on top, but also uh, concern around women's safety. And you will rem all remember that time uh, last year around the Sever Sarah Everard case, which um, was very prominent. So you can see there really materially standing out are those top four areas really with the final one being around leaving the EU. But we did even have, as you can see, 5% of uh, students saying they were concerned and anxious around the, the Megxit situation. So the Harry and Meghan situation that uh, was quite prominent last year. We asked students, how happy have they felt last year? So again, with the pandemic, it's kind of got to try and remember where we've been at with the student experience over the last couple of years, I suppose. But these would have been students that would have been um, you know, feeling the circumstances of the pandemic whilst they were at university. And um, only 23% of students actually felt that they were, they were happy. Um, which was uh, which was a, a kind of stark um, stark result, really. Uh, and then, interestingly, we looked at obviously this survey can be broken down by demographics of students, and we look at students in terms of type of accommodation that they're living in. But it was, there's a real material difference between students who were in halls versus students that were outside of halls. So you can see there that um, happiness does that did seem to decline with those students who were living outside of halls. So, you know, that might be around the halls, safe, secure, and you've got that kind of whole package and experience there. And as you, you, you go through university and moving into the private rented sector, it's probably just a reminder for us all that how do we make sure that the experience is really consistent for students beyond just living in, in halls within their first year accommodation. And then finally, uh, asking students uh, how safe did they feel at university? 43% of students saying that they felt safe, but a large amount of students feeling neutral on the issue and, and even 11% that's still feeling that they're, they're unsafe when they're actually at university. So coming this year is our, our, our next happiness index and we're actually doing that right now. So we've done all of our questions and, and it is in the process of being delivered. Um, we're going to very much continue with some of those core questions around how safe do students feel, how happy do they feel, just to see if there has been a, a shift at all in the last year. But we're also just going to start to focus on issues coming out of the pandemic, really. So how do we look beyond COVID-19 and start to look at how are students reacting to the cost of living crisis, um, well-being, but also safety there as well. So that's due to be released at the end of August. And we were really proud to have almost 4,000 students engage with the survey last year. So we're hoping for a really large platform of students that, that, that engage with it this year. And when those results come out, we'd be, be happy to share that with you. So this is you know, an example of the research and the, the, the approach we take to underpin all of our products. And Jamie is going to give you an overview of what the student assistance program actually is. And then I'll be talking to you a little bit about how students have engaged that service in the last 12 months. There we are. Thank you very much, Billy. Um, so yeah, as, as Billy said, it's very much a, an insight led a, a approach um, and, and developing the student assistance program. We didn't just sit 
in a room and kind of try to come up with something ourselves. We travelled up and down the country speaking to people who, um, you know, work with work with students, work on student wellbeing to come up with something that will help to um, support existing services uh, and, and, you know, and, and cover any gaps. So for us, this isn't about taking anything away from, from, from what you do. Um, it's about supporting and integrating with those existing services to relieve pressures. So there might be waiting lists for counselling um, or, you know, a lot of students who need, who need some support or it might be covering, you know, potential gaps, whether that's being able to cover and support out of hours, you know, so after 5 p.m. and at weekends or, or even outside of term time. Um, so obviously students will, will, will still need support, even if, um, you know, it's the Christmas break or Easter holidays or, or whatever it might be. And, and working in um, a collaborative way to achieve that is, is really important to us. That's how it started and that's how it's evolved and we'll continue to do that. And it's about building kind of understanding, trust and, and confidence between us providing the student assistance programme and the college or uni or, or, or accommodation or whoever it might need this in place. Um, and, it, and for us, it's about, you know, helping to raise awareness about mental well-being and, and, and being proactive uh, and, and providing something that students can reach out to, to get that support, um, which, you know, which, which helps everyone in, involved, really. I've just gone to the next slide, please, Bill. Um, so this is an overview of what, what it actually is, what, what, it, what it does. And as Billy said, it will come on to a bit of insight in terms of how it's being used. But the foundation of our student assistance programme is that it provides unlimited access for students to a 24-7, 365 day uh, um, telephone helpline where students can receive in the moment support from um, accredited counsellors. So there are loads of different issues that counsellors can support with. It might be that a student knows that they suffer from anxiety or depression and wants to talk about that specifically, or they might not know what's wrong or they just kind of have this dark cloud hanging over them. So they just want to, you know, to get something off the chest or talk through it with somebody. And that's exactly what the, the, the counsellors are there for. Um, you know, it can be everything from physical health, mental health. It's, uh, you know, we try to capture a, kind of a broad range of issues that students can, can talk about to reflect the, you know, the, the diversity within, within the student body as a whole. So being able to support students, um, at different life stages with different circumstances from different backgrounds is, is, is really important. So we want to make sure that every student feels comfortable uh, comfortable and being able to, to, to reach out and, and get that support. We don't divert any calls to, to any other country. We don't use bots or artificial intelligence or any answer machines or anything like that. It's always a UK based human that, that students will interact with. Um, and we'll, we'll come on to, I'll, I'll mention some of the Kind of the digital stuff that we have included in this as well but there's live chat and video calling um in, included within that and again that that's um that's that, that's a human um we also have the option in, 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 as well as the 24 7 helpline to include structured counseling um so if that's required we're able to do that and that complements that in the moment emotional support that we're able to provide and then we also have a solution um for students who are based overseas whether that's uh, UK students who are studying abroad or on placement or international students who are studying from from their home country then we also have a, an overseas student assistance program which provides in-country support something that's really difficult and there's often a um it's a there's a barrier to be able to provide that parity of service for UK students and students overseas because of all the different regulations and rules and, and laws that are kind of surround being able to provide counseling support so we've got solution to be able to provide in-country support uh, for those students. Importantly, um, there's also support for staff available through this. So this is for any, any staff who, you know, are working with students uh, and it may be on a weekend with reduced staffing levels that they've got a student that they need to support, but you're not quite sure how best, how to best approach that. Um, so staff are able to phone up the helpline, again, 24, 24 hours a day, speak with the counsellors that a student would be speaking to and just get some support and advice or to sense check a plan on how to support a student in that moment. So maybe we've, we've had an example of um, a, a, a member of security staff having to take a student to hospital because they tried to hurt themselves. Uh, and after they were checked, uh, had that checkup, they were released back into the care of, that, um, of, of, of the security team. 
uh, and we weren't quite sure what the what the best approach was. Um, so we were able in that instance to be able to phone up the help the helpline just to get that reassurance. Maybe the counsellor speaks to the student themselves or just provides kind of what the next step should be in the next couple of hours. But it's there just as a backup. And again, it's not taking anything away from any existing processes or procedures. It's just an extra level of, of reassurance for, for those staff members who may not necessarily be used to, to, to support the student in that way. The integration side of this for us is, is also really important. And it comes back to that not wanting to, to take anything away from existing services. So we work with our partners um, comprehensively and, and fully to understand the services, making sure that counsellors know what the services, what services are available internally as well. And just to make that, that partnership and that process as, as seamless as possible. And it is, is such a, a big part for us. Um, for students who are deemed at risk as, as part of the part of the calls, the counsellors will go through a, a, a risk assessment. So they'll be able to share that information back to provide accommodation, university, college, or whoever it may be, so that you can implement your own safeguards and processes and procedures and make sure that students got ongoing care um, after they've after they've reached out. And then to make sure that we've provided kind of a, a well-rounded service you know there are lots of apps out there there are lots of different kinds of services so we wanted to kind of bundle everything into in, into one so we've got an app uh portal as well and they're geared towards self-help resources there's articles um mini health checks things that are around about like i said that self-help but building resilience as well um so there's podcasts interviews with well-known people talk about their own mental health just trying to make support more accessible I suppose and, and, and being able to have that um, when, whenever the whenever the students need it. Through that they can also um, live chat with a counsellor, they can request a call back, they can email, they can phone straight from the app so they don't have to save the number necessarily. They've got the app, that, they've got that support and therefore they've got access to be able to, to, to reach out to a counsellor and, and get the help that, help that they need. Um, We've also got translation service available for any, any international students or students who, whose language uh, English isn't their first language. We can uh, got translation service in over two hundred and forty languages, uh, so they can you know effectively talk with a with, with a counsellor. It might be that a counsellor speaks the language, but if not, we'll be able to get a translator on the call to be able to facilitate that as well. And then we've got uh, deaf and hard of hearing um, support we can make materials available in braille so it's just about taking um taking away any potential barriers for students being able to to get support and we work with all of our partners to make sure that we're giving everyone a, a, a fair access to to help um when, whenever they need it there's practical support as well in terms of financial legal medical information so a lot of the time practical information can be linked in with with emotional support that's needed um, and the counsellors and advisors will work with the student to make sure they're getting all of the support they need. Sometimes they might fall about a, a practical issue and that kind of triggered more of an emotional response. So the advisor will be able to do a kind of a soft transfer over to a counsellor to give them that in the moment support. And then we have um, through the network of counsellors, obviously a very diverse, um, diverse uh, uh, selection of counsellors on, on our network. We were able to support any underrepresented groups. So it might be students from ethnic minorities or, or LGBTQ plus students. We can match counsellors depending on what the student needs. Um, so if they, if they do need specific support, as long as it's therapeutically beneficial, it will help that student, then, then we're able to, to do that as well. So that's the, that's the foundation. Appreciate a kind of a whistle stop tour. There's lots of lots of great things to it. But that's the foundation of, 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 of what it is and, and, and how it works. And then Billy's going to touch on some of the kind of key findings, if you like, some of the trends that we've seen and pulling out some what we think is quite interesting um, numbers in terms of what's being used and how it's being used. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, so we we this is just pulling out some headlines of how the, the, the program has been used by students in the last 12 months. So we'll, ju we'll just go through those now. And I think the, the thing to, to mention here as well is this is such an important element because it allows us to assess, you know, any trends or, or, or emerging themes that come through so that we can further develop the, the product, but it also keeps our partners informed. So um, any partner on the student assistance programme would have access to 
to, to, to MI to understand how the service is, is being used, um, but it is a confidential service for, for those students, um, other than the risk protocols that, that J Jamie mentions there. So I just wanted to start with uh, calls to the, the helpline. So just some key insights around here. So uh, at the moment, 60% of students are, act are actually using it, the, the helpline during core hours. So Monday to Friday, core university hours, nine to five really, um, which I think is interesting in two ways. Uh, students are feeling that they can use the service during their university um, study day uh, and during their time at university and that's kind of blending in with current services really well but also 40 percent of those calls are coming out of hours on weekends or late at night so just demonstrating how important an out of hours provision really is for those students 90 percent of calls are actually being made by the students themselves so Roughly 10% are being referred in by either, uh, you know, university wellbeing teams or, 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 or someone else at the university. So, again, it's great to see that students are feeling confident that they can actually call the, the wellbeing helpline them, themselves and, and make that initial contact, which is sometimes the, the most challenging step. And then we kind of got two key areas, really, of why someone might call. Um, either for emotional support, uh, in the moment support, or that general advice uh, area, whether it's around um, sort of housing advice or legal advice that they're looking for some support with. And, you know, the overwhelming majority of calls are actually for that emotional support. So 97% of calls in the last 12 months have been for people that are looking for that emotional support. So we've got our next poll, which is what is the most common counselling call category we've experienced so far on the student assistance programme? So um, what, why if effectively students been calling? What, what's been the, the, the main uh, reason for, for that? Uh, let's just see what pe people come out with. So yeah, mixture of uh, results there. So we can we can see here that uh, that the top uh, three counselling core categories, anxiety again, kind of being materially much larger than than other categories, low mood and depression. So I think everyone uh, every everyone had that there. Um, anxiety and depression we, we mentioned there. So when, when a student has called, as Jamie mentioned, the Student Assistance Programme can provide access to support beyond an in-the-moment conversation, so structured counselling. And as we recover from the pandemic and start to, to, to come out of that, we are seeing an increase in terms of that face-to-face counselling request be, be coming through. But in, from, we're going to just focus now on the, the digital side of things. And an interesting stat is when, when students are actually offered that digital counselling, they're offered the chance to either speak with the counsellor over the telephone or, or over a digital video, much like this, Zoom or Teams. And interestingly, it's very evenly split in terms of what students choose. So we haven't got any sort of anecdotal feed on that uh, at, at the moment as to why that is. But it just shows interestingly that you know just over half of students are actually wanting to you know see their counselor and engage with them digitally over, over the screen there even if they haven't got access to that kind of face-to-face -face service which um can be included we talked earlier about the three percent of calls being around advice so uh, i think um uh, you know, it's it, it, important to note here that a student may just be looking for some just general advice, anything really specific um, that, that needs specialist advice. The, the, um, the counsellors and the advice uh, support uh, team would always signpost them to the appropriate place. Um, and that might be something at the university or something elsewhere, depending on what um, is, is part of your kind of 
your portfolio basically of information that you've provided us as part of the student assistance program where to signpost such specialist um, queries but as you can see here um, the the top advice core categories we get the top one being around housing and landlord uh, challenges uh, then around course um, and, and rights around that uh, around study their, their jobs whilst they're at university any part-time jobs that they have and then immigration uh, an interesting one there as well for the, those advice calls in terms of demographics you can see here um you know quite quite interesting i think the thing that sort of stands out for uh for us at the moment is you know materially lower uh sort of percentage of male students accessing the service of female students so you know is there more work that we can be doing there to be encouraging male students to be reaching out and using the service because some of those challenges we mentioned earlier around you know feeling anxious not feeling safe and not necessarily feeling happy will be spanning across the genders genders not just for, for females um, but then interestingly, nearly a third of students aren't, aren't given a gender. So it's interesting to see that um, of what's coming through there. So that, that's it for the headline of Insight. We're constantly having more insight and more, more, more sort of statistics coming through. And we'd be happy to share even further detail on those with anyone who, uh, who wanted it. I suppose just to finish is just an overview of some of our partners. So as mentioned, we're very proud now to be providing the student assistance program to over 60 universities and colleges. And many of these universities and colleges we've been working with over a, over a long period of time on other products and services. Uh, but we're, we're, we're very proud to be protecting uh, almost 400,000 students now via, via the student assistance program. And uh, that's that's it for myself and Jamie. So any questions, I suppose, Lisa? And I'll stop screen sharing as well then. OK, I think I'm back. So we have some questions first and then um, we will um, move on to any questions that have come up in the Q&A. So let me get back to my questions. Okay. So thank you for going through all that as well. That was really interesting actually, um, because obviously we all know that mental health at the moment is a massive issue, especially for the students who went through everything, A level, you know, all the A levels, started university all the way through the pandemic. So obviously they, they might need some extra support. Um, so first question, obviously, um, most people would know Ensley um, as an insurance provider um, who helps protect students' property. Um, what made you move into being more of a mental health support provider? Yeah, sure, I can take that one. So um, I think that the, the key thing here is that uh, several years ago, working with universities, accommodation providers, student unions, it was evident that our partners that, that, that we, we were working with then were all experiencing similar challenges around supporting student well-being and having an adequate provision that, that complements what they what they were currently doing and are currently doing, and particularly around that kind of like out of hours uh, element that we talked about. And I think we're an insurance broker. We've set up 60 years ago by students because no one else would insure those students. And we're very proud to have a number of firsts um, over those 60 years. So trying to very much, you know, lead the way in the education sector and do the right thing. And when we look at what all of our customers were saying and, and, and sharing with us as a challenge, combined with our own insight and research around students themselves experiencing those wellbeing challenges, we asked ourselves, what can we do? How can we use our history and heritage to support our partners in this way? But also how can we use our resources? So you know, we've been around for 60 years. Uh, we're now part of the, the Howden Insurance 
broking group in the UK, very large, um, uh, you know, um, network of brokers there. So we're well back to be able to support. So then what we did was we, uh, we looked to a current uh, service provider around wellbeing and said, well, how can we take our expertise, which is about students, universities and the sector as a whole, and blend that with a, a service provider. Obviously, the employee assistance programs were already kind of well established at this point. How do we kind of marry that up to create a student assistance program? So we, we did that in conjunction with them, uh, but also with some of our key universities and some of our early adopters. So the, the product that you see today, there are key features within it that were kind of co-designed with universities as well. So that's really why we went into that space. And I suppose the final thing to mention is that our products and services, our other products and services, all have a role to play with student wellbeing. So the halls of residence that we insure, um, that we mentioned, or um, the personal accident insurance we provide to students at student unions when they're playing sport. If a student has their laptop stolen before their deadline, uh, you know, or injures themselves, that's quite a traumatic experience for those students you know we're settling claims and putting them back in the position that they were in but we challenged ourselves to go beyond that how how can we do more to support their well-being during what would be quite an anxious and difficult time for them so the whole thing fitted really um for us to to to, to start um you know working on and then we're very proud to to to, to be supporting the, the partners that we support today Thanks, Billy. Okay, next question was, um, how do you feel technology can help students' mental health? I'll, um, I'll say this one. Um, so I, I think, yes, technology is, is, is very important and you see that everything is, everything is digital, everything's online. Um, and I think that obviously the, this kind of generation of students, you know, if, everything's um, kind of even more important for them to, to be, to be digital and, and have that technology. And I think there's an expectation for, for things to be available, you know, via apps or, 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 or online. So with the app that we have, we, we were able to provide that support. Like as mentioned earlier, there's the self-help resources, there's many health checks to try and help students um, kind of raise their own awareness about their own mental well-being. Um, we have a mood tracker on there as well, which allows students to track their emotional and, and kind of financial well-being over a five-week period. And that's to try and get them to understand something that might have triggered a, a particularly good mood or a particularly low mood. Um, and then that is taking that whatever their response is, if it's a particularly low mood, then it will kind of trigger a, a notification for them to get in touch and speak with the counsellor to talk through it. Um, so having having that available and having that live like live chat has just been one of one of the more recent developments we've made, but it's really popular with students because it allows them to like I said, there's no bots, there's no AI. It is a, a real life human counselor on the on the other end of the on the other end of it. Um, so that has been really really important. But interestingly, as, as Billy pointed out, there's kind of the good old fashioned phone calls. Uh, are also popular you know when the, when the students are receiving counseling that there is still a, a, a need and a desire just to pick up the phone and, and, and speak to somebody um so it's it's getting the balance right between what we you know making sure everything's available but not just you know kind of keeping a bit of analog if you like in a, in, in the kind of increasingly digital world so it sounds a bit um cliche of that but it's just making sure that there is, is there is that support available and Make sure all students have access to, to the to the service through a method that they feel most comfortable with. But the, the beauty of the technology is that it is, you know, in, in a student's pocket, the, the live chat or the video call or the helpline, the, the email, that, that is available to them, you know, just, just in the pocket. So making sure that continues is um, is going to be really important. I think you're right. I think um speaking to people as well is is good in the way that it can often make them start talking about something else that they weren't gonna, you know, like talk about or they hadn't realized you know was causing them a problem really. Yeah. So I yeah, think absolutely and it, it, sometimes you can see on the see on the flip side that obviously with, with the social media and things like that, just how much pressure that, that, yeah. that can put on people. 
Um, so there's, there's obviously there's, you know, there's, there's kind of pros and cons to, to, to the ever increase in technology that, that's, that, that's available. So it's as long as we're aware of that and we're able to educate students um, and raise that, that, that self-awareness so they understand, you know, if they are feeling low, there is, there, there is someone to talk to, there's other people going through it. Um, so that, that support is available. Because I do think loneliness can be a really big problem um because everything is done on social media and you know all these pictures of people living the best lives when then you know it's not realistic and yeah, it's not the reality cases. it's not actually what their lives are like i think it can put a lot of pressure on students definitely well, oh yeah, yeah and, any, and everybody really um and thanks for that so um q3 um what um, feedback from the happiness index surprised you when you you got that back yeah I can cover this I think there, there wasn't anything that was necessarily um, a huge surprise obviously thinking about the time that we were asking students and the journey that they'd been on um, I suppose you know for many years now we know that mental health has been a challenge across society and for students so you know, seeing that wasn't a surprise in terms of that 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 kind of leading the way as a as a concern there, but it more just reaffirmed that students are still feeling that as a as a as a big issue. Um, I think it was the material difference of those students in second and third year living outside of accommodation. I say second and third year; they could have been first years. The you know the difference between you know living outside of halls of residence and living in. Um, you know, we, we know that the huge amount of work that goes into a good quality halls of residence provision and, in, and it's, it's just looking at that and thinking, how do you make sure that for all cohorts of students, no matter where they live, where they study, how is that experience consistent? And we know that's a challenge that all universities can sometimes face. Yeah, definitely. OK, um, we've just got a couple more. Um, how do you see the student assistance program developing further in the future? Good question. I think um, it really depends on on on, on what UD's colleges are coming to find, what what kind of the needs are, and, and what students need. Um, a lot of the work, how, how we've got to this position now, and a lot of the success, and, and why it has worked so well with you know a, a whole range of institutions, is that we've collaborated with them and, and being able to develop in response to, to, to what's needed. So things like the risk protocols, being able to share that information back to a university when a student's at risk, that was something that we did in partnership with the, with the, with the university. The support for students um, from an ethnic minority background or LGBTQ+, that has come in response to somebody asking us if there's anything we could, you know, we could, we could do to, to do that. Um, there's some of the, the, the developments that we've made with the, 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 like the communication materials, taking into account those students um, with dyslexia and therefore may struggle to, to, to be able to understand what we've, some, some of the original kind of posters and, and, and articles and stuff that we've got. So a lot of it comes because of, you know, we're open to making changes. It's, it, 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 it's not a finished product. I don't think it ever will be because it just constantly constantly evolves. So I think some of the changes may be, you know, expanding the ways in which students can access the access support, maybe new pathways, that there may be a new way in which we can integrate um, into systems with it with the university to make that data sharing even more um, even more seamless. Um, it may be that we change the the, the counselling model approach. Um, but I think the, the, the beauty of it is, is that it, you know, it can work for a, a university with 40,000 students or a, a college with, with you know, 200 students. It's, it's a, a kind of a framework that can be expanded or, 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 or decreased or however it needs to be. Um, so, so, yeah, who knows? <laughs> but um, we're, we, we are led by what, what, what is needed and, and respond to that. And we've got some things in, in, in the pipeline with, with the app and the portal. Uh, but it, yeah, it's just very much respond, listening and just responding to, what, to what's needed. Oh, thanks for that. Um, so um, last question from 
from me um, is if you could, um, I think you might have covered this actually, but um, can you tell us more about who provides the counselling to the students? Yeah, yeah, of course. So it, it's 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 not not you know it's not us, not me, and, me and Billy or anything like that. But we we work with um, health assurers who people may well have heard of. They are the largest uh, independent um, assistance program provider in the UK. So they're the ones who've got decades of experience in providing counselling and, and, and wellbeing support. So we teamed up with them, was, I think it's about three, three plus years ago now, to co-develop the Student Assistance Programme. They are a, a big employee assistance programme provider, but they've got the kind of the, the foundations and the infrastructure to be able to develop and deliver what, what we wanted. Obviously, employees and students are very different in, you know, in the approach and their issues and how universities work. So we've we've used their their experience and expertise in delivering a service like this, combined it with, as Billy said, our 60 years of, of working with universities, colleges, and all the quirks that come with that um, and in and, and the education sector and, and co-develops this with input from, from, from uni. So all the counsellors are from, from, from Health Assured, they're, they're all BACP accredited, they've got all the experience and, and insurance and, and CPD and all the qualifications and everything that you'd, you'd hope and, and, and want. Um, so yeah, so that's, 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 who, um, that's who delivers it for us. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so if we move on to um, questions from the attendees. So we've got one in the Q&A. Um, which I'll read out for Rose. Um, do you have anything specific to signpost the services to international students as they can be difficult to engage? Yeah, so this again, it's, it's, it's something that we've been working on closely with the, with the, the universities because, because of this. And what we say is, although there are kind of shared, um, uh, shared kind of difficulties or, or issues that might pop up that every uni is a, bit, a little bit different but in terms of the international students we can do uh, translate all translate all of our all of our materials so that they can read read, read the materials in their own in their own language um, we've done specific kind of um, awareness sessions for international students so we can do kind of a video call like this so they can come on and, and understand it a little bit more um, and it's just kind of what we say is keeping it in the kind of in, in the ether that something like this, this, this is available. It's, it is just finding the best ways to do it. So whether we do put kind of specific events on or collaborate with, you know, international office or, or, or something like that to be able to provide that support. Um, it's yeah, it's, it, it can, it can, it can be tricky. Um, you know, the cultural differences that, that play into it as well. You know, students may be from a country that um, doesn't have this kind of support or, um, you know, it may, it may well be frowned upon to, you know, to open up and, and reach out for support. So it's just about reassuring students. Um, and if we can do that in a way that they feel comfortable with and they understand better. So if it is, it's sometimes it can be as simple as translated something into their own language so they, they can do that. And then just reassuring them that, you know, we do have translators available with the counsellors as well to be able to facilitate those conversations. Um, but it is, yeah everybody's a, a, a bit different and what we say is the, the colleges, whoever it is no well let's just say we're always we're always you know we're all ears um and we'll just find the best way and we'll just try trial things as well it's you know we'll give something a go if the engagement increases great if not we can try something else thanks jamie and um, it's so true that we've just done um a a big um, survey with international students actually um, and one of the things that we actually found out is that um, the word well-being doesn't actually translate into Chinese so when people sign think post things as well-being services they don't actually understand what that is in most oh. cases so that was a bit of a shock <laughs> yeah, you, you, you just take it for granted don't you that yeah, that's how we say yeah. that's, therefore that's it but that's, yeah. that's, that's really interesting yeah so, I mean, it's just how you, um, you know, get it over to them, really. Interesting. So, um, have anyone else got any questions? If you want to raise your hand, I can um, let you ask it yourself, or if there's anything else to type. 
if not then I think like we can finish just a little ahead of time which it's gone really quick it's so interesting to be honest no nobody okay brill Lisa, I'll pop, I'll pop our details in the chat for people if yeah, anyone would definitely. like to follow up at all. Um, I'll just pop it in there now, but thank you everyone Brilliant. for your time. We'll be um, publishing the video from this as well on our website um, and we'll have um, links to the happiness index um, so you can take a look, um, the one that obviously is published and um, any other details from um, Ensley so you can take a look at that when that's on the website um, but if you've got any questions you can always email me and I'll make sure that um, Billy and Jamie get them so thanks for joining us we really appreciate it so thanks, thanks everyone so for much your time. Doing this. I do appreciate it um, take care everyone How, enjoy the sunshine thank you everyone <laughs>